The sermon I'm going to be preaching tonight is entitled, They Went Out From Us. This is a completely different sermon than what I had originally intended on preaching tonight. So in light of events that have just happened recently, I feel compelled to, to speak on this. I think it's important for everybody here. Um, obviously, there, we have a, a strong connection, even though we're independent church, we're independent Baptist church, there's a very strong connection with Faithful Word Baptist Church. They're going to be the ones that end up taking over this church to, to keep Word of Truth Baptist Church open after I leave. It's a church that I was taught in and trained from. Pastor Anderson is a very good friend of mine, and, uh, and he was a great mentor and a good man of God and, and is doing a great work for God. As I mentioned, we are independent. If I see things different, if, if there's a difference of doctrine or difference of opinion, we're going to believe what we believe from the Bible. We don't take orders from anybody. I don't get direction on what you need to believe from anybody other than Scripture. Now, that being said, I do listen to lots of preachers. I listen to other people because I do not, I do definitely have not arrived to some spiritual point to where nobody can teach me anything and that I know all things in the Bible and nobody can help me understand anything. That's not the case at all. There are pastors that can teach me things. There are laymen that can teach me things. Anybody who's a born-again believer can teach me something from the Bible that maybe God has given them knowledge of that I don't have. And that's fine. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, and I don't care. There's a lot of people that might question or they always want to cast doubt on people's integrity. But anyone that goes to this church are the people I care about the most anyways. And people go here, know me, and they know better that I'm not just, I don't take orders from anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just say that. But there have been a lot of events that have happened. And I haven't, I haven't preached very much about what happens in other churches. I kind of leave that for, for other people to deal with. Because, you know, as, as much as a problem, I pray for other churches. You know, I, I don't like seeing that happen. But every once in a while, things will happen that are kind of on a bigger scale. And there's a lot of people that are listening. There's a lot of people that are uh, paying attention to this. And even people within our own church stay up to date with what's going on. There's, it's, it's really quick to get information these days with social media. And the events that happened just within the past 24 hours, to my knowledge, I just found out about it after church this morning. This whole deal with the, with the Trinity, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with what's been happening at Faithful Word, with the heretics. Yeah, the heretics and the false prophets and the false teachers that have come out of there teaching their Pentecostal oneness modalist garbage Heretical, false doctrine. Jonathan, go sit down right now. Go sit down. These people that have been teaching their false doctrines. <clears throat> you thought it was done with. I thought it was done with. I thought it was over. But apparently it's not. Just recently we heard Dominique Davis is, you know, left the church because he's sucked into this oneness garbage. But, you know, I didn't know him that well. He attended Faithful Word after I left. But I just found out that Garrett Kirchway now also has been sucked in to, some, to this oneness teaching. And, and when I first heard it, I was just, I, was, I mean, I was blown away. I think I, Garrett is someone that I've known for a very long time. I've known him personally. I've gone out soul winning with him. He was at Faith Lord Baptist Church a long time. I, I, you know, I thought I knew him really well, and I do feel like I've known, you know, I've, I've known him over the years, and um, it, it grieves me, and it, it still grieves me to, to hear about this. But um, I just, I just got done watching a video that he put out recently. Just today, he he published it. So, um, and. It's the same oneness talking points that, that everyone else is sucked into. Now, what I, I, I'm going to hit a couple different subjects, and I'm going to start off just preaching a little bit of encouragement because, you know, as much for me as anyone else that, that looks to people who look to be like pillars and, and, you know, real solid men of the faith that, that we can look up to and learn from, 
And when a man fails you, we need not to be discouraged about that, but to be able to continue forward. And we need to make sure that our doctrine is always found and, and received from Scripture and not in any man. Not in any man. The Bible says uh, in Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. We need to treat what we believe, our doctrine and everything as, hey, let every man be a liar, but God's true. We need to be able to believe what the Bible says, regardless of who's preaching it, regardless of, of anyone else that might be on our side. Anyone else that might believe the same as you, you need to be able to get your, your doctrine straight from Scripture. And, and just number one important is have integrity with God's Word. And we need not to be discouraged when men fail you because they will. The Bible says in Galatians 1, verse number 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So we have the apostle Paul here writing to the churches at Galatia, writing to the Galatians. People he's personally gone and witnessed to and won to the Lord. And there's a church set up there. And other people now have come in. Heretics have come in preaching their works-based salvation and, and troubling the people there and deceiving them and kind of getting them carried off into this, this wicked, false, works-based salvation. But look at what he says. He says in verse number eight, and keep your place. We're coming, I'm coming back to 1 John. Just, just put a bookmark there or whatever. In verse number eight, he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He's including himself. He said, look, it doesn't matter if it's one of us. If the apostle Paul comes to you and preaches another gospel than what he's already preached, than what he's already given unto you, he says, let him be accursed. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. It doesn't matter who it is. The, the, the gospel is the truth. It's the truth. Is what I'm preaching to you right now, this is the truth. And if anyone preaches anything contrary to this or different from this, it doesn't matter who says it. It's wrong. He says, not only is it wrong, he says, let him be accursed. An angel from heaven is trying to tell you another gospel. He says, let him be accursed. One of the apostles comes and tries to preach to you another gospel. Let him be accursed because God is not a respecter of persons and we ought not to be either. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. God's doctrine, whether it be the doctrine of salvation or any other doctrine, doctrines of the Bible need to be taught and received and believed on as being a servant of Christ and not pleasing man, no matter what that is. And hopefully you've already seen in this church that I don't care what people think about what I believe. I'll preach things that are unpopular. I'll preach things that other people don't agree with. It doesn't matter to me who agrees with what I believe and who doesn't agree with what I believe. What matters to me is what God thinks about my belief. Now, I know there's going to be the trolls that love to question integrity, but I, do, I would just say bear witness then. You think my, my beliefs and my thoughts are not my own? It's not the first time I've heard that before. Lots of people like to, to place blame on someone else. See, here, here's what's going to happen. I can tell you this right now, and you'll see this if you, if you go on social media at all, if you go on YouTube, you go on Facebook. There is a cer certain segment of people that have just grown to hate Pastor Anderson. They hate him. And all of many different reasons. All kinds of different reasons why people hate Pastor Anderson. So what they like to do is just tie everything against him. And you know what's funny is that this, this is the same thing that happens in marriages all over, the all over the place. When you have someone, I remember when I got married to my wife, 
There was people accusing, basically, you know, because she got saved before we got married, and she started coming to church, and she started changing her life. Why? Because she actually believes. I wasn't forcing her to believe a certain way. I wouldn't have even married her if she didn't believe what she believed. She ended up coming to church and getting saved and believing first on her own. Regardless of whether or not we would have gotten married, she believed God's word and started applying God's word in her life. But guess who got the blame for changing the, the, my wife, for changing Leslie? It's me. So people don't want to hate her because they love her for, for the changes that were made. So they need a scapegoat. They need someone else to pin the blame on. So guess who that blame comes on me? Well, it's the same thing with, uh, with other experiences in my life personally. You know, people don't want to accept that I believe a certain way. So they, they try to pin the blame. Well, many people pin the blame on, oh, Pastor Anderson makes you, know, he's the bad guy. He's the one that's corrupted. He's the one that, you know, and, and people do this all the time. So you may have someone People out there, listen, they, they, they hate Pastor Anderson, but they're not willing to just go on, this, on board and just hate on all these other different pastors and stuff. So they just want to blame and say, oh, yeah, well, well he's, just, he's just a mindless idiot. He's just following. You know, no, they don't, they don't want to accept that, you know what, there are many thinking people out there that actually know their Bibles really well. And if you think I'm just a mindless robot, come on and challenge me. Okay, if you think I am just a novice, you think I'm just repeating what someone else says, Come approach me with your Bible in your hand and, you can, and we'll see. You can see how mindless I am. No, I know what I believe. I know exactly what I believe from the Bible and I can defend what I believe from Scripture. But I don't need to defend myself because you know what? These aren't my words anyways. These are God's words. And the, the doctrines that I hold, I believe, line up with Scripture. It shouldn't matter who the person is, is that is the mouthpiece of a doctrine, of a truth, of a teaching. What matters is, does it line up with God's Word? And that's what we need to, to measure everything against. Now, in one sense, I'll, I'll put a caveat in there. In one sense, it does matter because... You still, you still have to be able to take things on the, um, the content itself. That, that, is, that is true no matter what. That is absolutely true. Whatever the content is, is, is judged based on the content, not on the person who's giving it. However, I'm not going to be listening to people who are known unbelievers anyways when it comes to biblical doctrine because I already know that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. So if someone's a known heretic or known um, just, just known to be an unbeliever, then there's no reason to be listening to their, to their view on what the Bible says. Like, why, why would I listen to an atheist on what the scripture says? I've already listened to plenty of their arguments too many times, and it, it's just obvious that they don't understand scripture at all. I mean, they hate it, they have their own agenda, and they don't want to have anything to do with it, so... Um, their arguments are always just completely ignorant anyways. But I got to digress. I'm getting too far off point here. There are people that are out there, and I believe these, attack, these are attacks that are coming, and that there is, Satan is, has been creeping in because of the amount of work that's been done for the Lord, because of the good things that have been done, the, the people's lives that have been changed, and all of the work and all the progress that's being done there is a major attempt now to try to break up and to minimize the impact that Faith Forward Baptist Church is having. Well, I'm not going to stand by while this is going on. I, I want to make sure where I stand is very clear between people who are ever going to come to our church, people who are thinking about coming to our church, if people get kicked out because they believe in this oneness junk, I don't ever want them coming to our church. And people need to know where we stand on this subject. I've already preached on this once before just to make sure everyone was clear. But I'm going to be bringing this up again. But let's deal with some of these people that have been, that have been coming up even recently. Remember, we started reading in 1 John chapter 2 
The Bible says in verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. This was written some 2,000 years ago, roughly. And he was saying it's the last time then. How much more close are we? It is still, I mean, we're still in the last time. We're still in that same, you know, time frame of being the last time. But as, we, as the day approaches, it's, things are going to get worse and worse. And we're going to see that in just a minute um, from first or Second Timothy chapter 3. But he says, little children, it is the last time wherever you heard the Antichrist shall come. We know there's going to be like the Antichrist that comes in the last times. Even now are there many Antichrists. So even at that time, there's a lot of people who are, who are disrupting the faith and sowing discord and, and attacking God's people and attacking good doctrine and trying to spread all this, this perversion and, and false doctrine among the churches. But then he says in verse number, he says, whereby we know it's the last time because, of, because these people are abounding. We know it's the last time. Verse number 19, they went out from us. So these people that he's talking about, these many antichrists that were there at that time, they went out from us. They originated or they started within their movement. They came from within the churches of the apostles. When you have all these multitudes being saved and you got these churches growing, well, guess what happened? There were people that came from those churches so that went out from us, but they were not of us. He said they weren't really one of us. They weren't really, they didn't really believe what we believed. They, they appeared to believe. They stayed with us for a while, but the end, eventually they made themselves known. They came out and said, nope, we're not of them. And even the video I just saw today, Garrett Kirschway, of course, there's always other things that end up getting all mixed in and tied together with these false doctrines and perversions. Even just in what, it's supposed to just be this video. Well, I don't know what it's supposed to be, whatever you want it to be, but he's trying to give his explanation of why he believes oneness is the true thing and even calls it oneness. And, you know, these other guys are trying to say, oh no, it's not oneness, it's not oneness. Well, Garrett Kirschway called it oneness. He's not making any bones about it. He's calling it what it is because that's exactly what it is. It's oneness. But in the, in the course of his explanation, because I listened to the whole thing just to see what he would say, and it's these same tired arguments that have already been answered. But he brings up then, oh, well, and the angels are the sons of God. And he brings up this, you know, this other stuff, and it's like, that is so easily disproven. It's already been disproven. But what, what, it's just like, well, what else don't you believe? What else is, are all the things that are being taught that you don't believe, it's probably a whole bunch. But see, he's just been there for a long time, gotten on staff, you know, doing his own. I thought he was a great guy. I did, okay? This is, this, it, you know, it grieves me. I said that, it, it, it grieves me because when you have someone that you feel really close to and someone you feel very, you know, good friends with, I've invited him to preach at our church on more than one occasion. But I start listening to this, and it's, and it's almost like the twilight zone. I can't believe my ears. You think someone's on board. You think someone believes the right doctrine. You think someone just agrees with all this stuff, and all of a sudden it just starts coming out. It's just like, what in the world? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt. So is there any doubt about this? If someone goes out and be like, oh, well, they're just a little bit mixed up. Oh, this person that becomes a teacher. Okay, these are not, these are not, look, this is not just a layman. These are people that are coming out that, you know, Tyler Baker, Garrett Kirschway, you know, people who are being ordained and sent out basically to be teachers, to go out and start ministries. And, and have been with, the ch with churches for a long time. They're not some brand new convert that's just a little mixed up. They're not th these children that are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You understand the, ch the children that get tossed to and fro that aren't grounded and found in the faith. 
That makes sense. We know that's going to happen. That's why we need to be you know, teaching them, teach good doctrine. These people are not that way. They've read their Bibles. They should know better. But had they been of us, right, of the truth, of this movement, had they been of the people that John was with, they would no doubt have continued with us. He says they would not have left, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That's how we know. This is how you can know. Yeah, they're not of us. Why? Because they went out that they could be known that they are not of us. They were never part of us. This also, I believe, sheds some light on a passage that some may have difficulty with in Hebrews chapter 3. You could turn there if you'd like. I've covered this verse uh, kind of recently when I went over assurance of salvation, I believe, was the sermon I, I touched on this. Obviously, we believe in the eternal security of the believer. We believe that, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you put your faith in Christ, you have eternal life. Nothing could change that. Now, when people make themselves known that they're not of us and they get called out as being, well, I don't believe that person's saved. Then you have the critics that will say, oh, then you, I, thought, I thought all you had to do was believe in Jesus to be saved. Now it's believe in Jesus and all my doctrines to be saved. No, that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that they are now becoming made known who they really are. Now it's being made known that they never believed. It was never something that they accepted. And, and why is that so hard to believe when you could have a person that has shown deceit for so long to the, to the point of getting up and preaching that this is the truth. Oh, yeah, I'm behind this. This is what I believe. Preaching Trinity, preaching. I mean, and the Trinity is a very basic doctrine. Okay, it's a very fundamental doctrine. The reason why I'm even making such a big deal out of this is because the Trinity is just core to who God is. I mean, this is, this is just as important as the reason why we tell Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses that they're not saved, even if they said they only believe in Jesus. If they have a different Jesus, they're not saved. Well, if you have a different God, you're not saved. Who God is is very important. Hebrews chapter 3, there's this verse, it says in verse 14. Again, we already have a mountain of evidence that explains that you have eternal life. You can never lose your salvation. Verse number 14, though, says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So people look at well, what does that mean? Like, so we have to just continually. Just hold our confidence all the way in the end. If we, and if we falter, if we, if we don't, then does that mean we lose our salvation? No. But what I believe this is showing us is that, now I, I don't believe that it is possible for a believer to become an unbeliever. I don't believe that. And this is one of the verses why I actually believe that to be the case. But the Bible also says that the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Even in my, just from my own personal experience, in my worst times, in times where I would have any doubt or anything like that, my salvation, I still had the Spirit bearing witness with my spirit. Deep down inside, I still knew that I was saved. And even amongst my doubts of just, did I believe? Am I a believer? I never was like, I don't believe in any of it. <laughs> I don't believe. I was just worried that was I really saved because I believed on Christ as opposed to, you know, just saying, no, I, no, it's all just fake. It's all phony. I don't believe that a believer would ever do that because, I mean, you know, verses like this, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We, we need to hold that, you know, being a, made a partaker of Christ we've hold that confidence, that, that faith in Christ steadfast unto the end. 
that belief is there. Even if it's just, just very small, you know, it's, it's there. And um, I believe when that's not there, it's just evidence that they, they may have been out from us. Maybe they were in the congregation. Maybe they went to church for a long time. But once they, made, they went out from us, they were not, it was made known that they weren't really of us. Because the problem you have as a, as a human being is that you can't see somebody's heart. You can only see what they show on the outside. Now, oftentimes, you know, the, the, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you could hear things that will give you indications on what's in a person's heart. But there are deceivers out there. There are deceivers. There are people that will tell you lies. There are people that will lie to you and people that will come in and eventually it comes out, but it may not come out for a while. So those deceivers, you know, you don't know at the time, but you do end up finding out. And then you end up finding out, yeah, well, they never had their confidence. They didn't hold their confidence steadfast because they never had it to begin with. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three, verse number one, the Bible reads, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We know we're in the last days, just as John already said that they were in the last days. We're definitely in the last days. Perilous times shall come. They are perilous. Look at verse number five. Continue, I'm not going to read everything for sake of time. The Bible says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are people out there, and this is talking about reprobates. This is all about reprobates in the last times, people who are ever learning. What are they doing? They're reading their Bible. They're studying. They're reading books. They're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They may be able to quote Bible verses to you, but they are not able to actually come to the knowledge. No matter how much they read and study, they don't ever get the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. We have an example being given here of what's going to come in, in, the, in the last times of reprobates, people coming from within and standing against a great spiritual leader. Now, in this case, it's Moses. Now, I'm not saying that Pastor Anderson is Moses, but he is a great spiritual leader of our time. He is someone that a lot of people look to. He is someone who's doing a lot of work for the Lord. And to say otherwise is just to be ignorant and just you just don't want to accept truth. The truth of the matter is he's doing a great work. He's doing a lot. And um, there are going to be people, there's going to be reprobates that are going to stand up and withstand and resist the truth that's being taught. Just as Janus and Jambres did in the last times, there's going to be people who are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth as Janus and Jambres. And... They are going to be reprobate and resisting the work and resisting the truth. Verse number nine says, but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Basically what it's saying is that their foolishness is going to be made known unto everybody. And that is becoming more and more apparent. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute, especially with Tyler Baker. That guy, I've seen some really foolish clips coming out of that guy's mouth and it, and I think God has just totally darkened his understanding of anything to just make it known widely how, how foolish he really is and, um, and just make it manifest unto all men. Verse number 10. Now look at what the Apostle Paul is going to say here to Timothy. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. So just when he gets done explaining that there's these reprobates, there's these, these false teachers, these people who resist the truth, now he's saying, but you know me, you know my doctrine, you know my manner of life, you know my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. He's using this as his evidence saying that he's not like the reprobates. Why? Because you know my doctrine. 
Why? Because you know my manner of life. You know my purpose. You know my faith. You know me. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They might say the, the, the right thing for a while, but it'll always be made known. Their folly will always be made manifest. The Bible teaches us very clearly that if you are of God, you will receive God's word. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read John 8 for you. John chapter 8, verse 41, the Bible says, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? He's saying, why do you not understand me? Why, why don't you understand what I'm saying? Here's why you can't understand what I'm saying, because you can't hear my word. You cannot receive it. Why don't you? Because you can't. It's impossible for them to understand. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, who do you, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. He's saying if you're of God, you're going to hear God's words. And hearing by hearing, it's, you know, that's the understanding too. It's not just the words are going into your ears physically audibly. He's talking about understanding God's words. You get the understanding. When you're saved, when you're of God because you're born again, you hear God's words. And anybody who's saved ought to be able to attest to this. I know I could. When I tried reading the Bible before I got saved, I was reading a book. I had zero understanding. I didn't have a clue what the book was talking about. And I wasn't some dumb person. I wasn't ignorant. I had good reading comprehension. I had a good vocabulary. I would be able to read, you know, Shakespeare written around the same time that the English Bible was translated. I could understand that. I could read those stories. I could have comprehension. I could understand what they're saying. But when I would pick up the Bible and try to read it, I had no clue what I was talking about. The lights were off. I had no understanding before I was saved. After I was born again, now when you pick up the book and start reading it, you actually start to understand what it's talking about. You may not understand absolutely every word and every, every single truth and every single meaning, but you actually understand. You can start reading it and start learning and gaining knowledge from it. Why? Because you're of God. Because now you can hear God's words. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. And these false prophets become known and it becomes evident that they're not of God because when they start spouting off their heresy, not, I mean, it, it just, it continues and spirals out of control, it gets worse and worse and worse and they start saying more and more damning things and it's just like, you have no comprehension of the word of God, do you? And the reason why is because they're not saved. And I have no problem saying that. Now, I'm not going to speak for every single person, especially every single person who's come out recently. I don't know. I haven't maybe heard enough out of their own mouth yet. But Tyler Baker, for sure, for one, that guy is not saved. Heretic Tyler Baker. Here, here is something that he's blasphemed God lately in a video clip he's put out recently, mocking the sacrifice that God gave of his son. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go out soul winning, one of the, the illustrations I give, because I, I explain who Jesus Christ is, I explain that Jesus Christ was the son of God, I explain that he is God in the flesh. I explain who he is. I also explain that even though we're sinners and deserve this punishment of hell, God actually still loves us. And God loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. And I think that's a very strong 
testament to God and his love for us to be able to give his only begotten son for you. And I use this example. I use this household. Why? Because it's a truth in the Bible. That's why I use it. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. I think everyone's heard it before. For God so loved the world. What does it say? He loved the world so much. How did he show his love for the world? He gave his only begotten son. And what I do is I ask people, especially, especially people who have children, parents, and just, and just get them to realize what God has done for them so they can see and understand the love that God actually has for them so they can receive the truth and be saved. It's powerful. I'm a father of five. It's hard for me to imagine being able to say I, would sac I could sacrifice any of my children for anybody else. To say, yeah, I'll let my child die and die a torturous death so you can live. Someone else, maybe someone who's not related to me. And then on top of that, not just be someone else, but be someone else who's done me wrong. I think that demonstrates a very powerful love. And I have five children. At the very least, I could say, yeah, I love all of my children. I love them all equally, but I still have others. But to only have one. And you say, I'm willing to give that up. That demonstrates a very strong love. But this is what boggles my mind. You can have somebody that puts out a sermon that mocks, that makes a mockery of God's love for us, of the Father's love to be willing to sacrifice his only begotten son, mocks that just, to, just because he's so wrapped up in his oneness that he's blind. And he, and he makes fun of it to just, to just, oh, well, Jesus and God and the Father are one, so. And, and what he was doing here, it's because he hates Pastor Anderson. He was trying to, to mock what Pastor Anderson was teaching about John 3.16, about what the Bible actually says. And here's his quote. I, I actually played it and I wrote it down verbatim so that you can hear exactly what he said. Now, what he's doing here is he's describing what Pastor Anderson was teaching. Here's what he said. He says, the greatest expression of love is to have someone else die instead of you. It's like, if someone's got to die for the world, son, I'm going to need you to go. And this is exactly how he was saying it. And then there's all this laughter. Ha, 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 ha. Everyone's laughing. It's a big joke. It's like, if someone's going to die for the world, son, I'm going to need you to go do it. You know, like, as, as, if, as if the Father in heaven is a coward because he's sending his son to go die for the world instead of him dying for the world himself. That is the mockery. And then he says, how stupid can you be? How stupid can you be, Tyler Baker? Do you not know John 3.16? And then his whole point, he's, he's quoting, you know, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So what he took exception with in his sermon was that Pastor Anderson was trying to show how great of, of love and, and the greatest expression of love is to, you know, to be able to give your, your son. And he's trying to, to argue that with, you know, when Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, first of all, that verse says, greater love hath no man than this. Not God. God's not a man. But he's, he's in, in his trying to make an argument of nitpicking, you know, the absolute, absolute greatest love, he makes a mockery of the Father's love. And I'm sorry, but I question anybody 
that can watch a clip like that and hear the words out of his own mouth. These aren't edited. This isn't, it's, it's a clip he put out himself. He edited himself. These are his words. You could listen to that and your blood not boil at the mockery that he's making of God's love. I question your salvation. Yeah, I do. And I've seen pastors commenting in support of Tyler Baker. Why? Because they hate Pastor Anderson, that they're willing to promote and not rebuke a blasphemer because of their own pride, because of their own hatred for a man of God. And because the vast majority of them anyways are reprobate false teachers who don't know God. <clears throat> now I'm going to get into a little bit, I took a little bit more time kind of covering just this whole aspect before we even get into it. I want to get into some Trinity doctrine because it's important. I've gone over this before, but I just want to, I want to make a, a few real basic points just showing how simple this is. The Trinity doctrine, first of all, did not originate with the Catholic Church at any council. Because that's what people always want. Oh, the Catholics came up with this. The, the Council of Nicaea, or this council, or that council, and it was in 300 AD. As if, and first of all, like the same people that'll, that'll tell you that, you know, oh, they, they don't trust that evidence for other doctrines when people try to say, oh, the Catholic Church started this, or started that, or started this. If it's something that they believe in, they don't, they don't accept it. But then when it fits their agenda, now they're willing to go with just the world's wisdom and just say, well, this is what Catholic history says, so this is where it started. This is where it originated from. No, actually, and actually what's stupid about all of that is that they, they cite these, you know, what they're doing is they're, they're going to, I assume, they must be going to people's websites where there's, People are, are promoting oneness or, promote, you know, or you know, attacking Trinitarian or whatever, and they're using these arguments. But if you actually know, if you actually look at what was going on in these councils anyways, what they were trying to do was to just come to a consensus on things that were already taught and believed. The example that I use, I've used this recently, is Easter. People say, oh, don't you know that Easter started from the Catholic Church? It's a Catholic tradition and everything else. Because, again, quoting the same council. No, it's not. What they did at that council is they decided what day they were going to celebrate Easter. Why? Because people were celebrating Easter on different days. So you had some groups of people were celebrating on a certain day, and other people were celebrating on a different day, and they wanted to just have some type of unity on that day. It doesn't mean that that's when it started. It means that's when they solidified in their own doctrine what they were going to do. The teaching of the Trinity had been around. It wasn't some brand new teaching that all of a sudden someone at this council said, hey, I've got an idea. God is three persons, one God. That's not how it happened. People have already believed this for hundreds of years. The Catholics just had their council to determine what is the Catholic Church going to believe. That's foolishness to say that it just originated with the Catholic Church. It's stupidity. It's people who don't think critically and can't think for themselves and go and just read what other people write and just believe whatever they want to believe. The Trinity is actually very well defined. I don't know how far back you could go into history and people understood the Trinity or, or would teach the Trinity. But I'll tell you what, it's pretty well defined when John wrote his epistle in 1 John chapter 5. I could guarantee it's been taught since that time at least. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? I'm going to take a break here just for a second and just point out, think about how many times you read in the Bible the Son of God about Jesus Christ. What type of nonsense If Jesus Christ, if the Son is the Father, how does that even make any sense at all? What would be the point of even bringing up the fact that he's a son? 
It's just God. Why not just refer to him as God the whole time? Why cause this confusion? Is God the author of confusion? Because I didn't think that he is. The Son of God. You have to, and you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God in order to be saved. Now, I personally believe that we have to have the right Jesus. We have to believe that Jesus Christ is deity to be saved. But what you're going to find way more often in Scripture is that you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God in order to be saved. You're going to find that literally spelled out. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is God. But when we, what, I mean, think about even the Ethiopian eunuch. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized in Acts chapter 8? If thou believest, thou mayest. And what he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that was, that's what he needed to believe to be saved. Verse number 6, 1 John chapter 5, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Very simple teaching. The whole point of explaining that there's three that bear record in heaven is, goes all the way back to God's law of saying that at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's how you know what the truth is because you have three testimonies. You have three witnesses, three separate witnesses, distinct, distinctly separate from one another. My witness wouldn't stand according to God's law if I said, well... As a father, I saw this person kill that person. And then as a husband, I saw this person kill. And, and, and there's my two witnesses. Because in, in my two different modes, I, I saw this happen. And so my witness must be true. That wouldn't work. So why would that work for the, for the record to be born in heaven if, if God just appears in modes or if God's just this, this oneness? Now, I do believe that these three are one, but they're one God because there are, very, there are three distinct persons within the Godhead. And what, what I hear these, these critics say, and, and the big thing now is, you know, it's funny how their argument shifts too. At first, they're saying, oh, no, no, it's actually just a little bit different than what you believe. And it goes from that, these deceivers that don't want to, to draw too much attention to what they believe, then all of a sudden, when they're exposed, then it really comes out, oh, you're polytheistic. Now, what's funny, and what I just even heard today, is that even Garrett Kirchway was saying, well, that's, uh, you know, three persons, three separate entities, three separate, that sounds polytheistic to me. But then he goes on to explain what he believes, and he's saying, well, there's definitely a distinction. I mean, you have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have the Son's going to reign in the, millennial, in the millennial kingdom, and then he's going to pass over control to the Father. Well, you know what that sounds like, Garrett? That sounds like polytheism to me, if you're going to call the Trinity polytheistic, because now you have two people, one of them in charge, and then passing authority to the Father. How is that not polytheistic, yet the Trinity is? Oh, because you just call yours a distinction and you don't call it a person. We are talking about them like people. Let, while we're on that, let's talk about persons. First of all, the word person is used many times, but it's actually used twice referring to God and to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, To whom ye forgave it, forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. So I'm not the person of Christ. Christ has a person. And then in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, God 
who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's going to describe the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So what does that say? By whom also he made the world. By the Son, God made the world. Right? You still with me? Verse number three who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus being the brightness of God's glory, right? We're following the pronouns here, the he and the his. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Jesus is the express image of God's person. We have a person of Christ and a person of God the Father. So why, again, is it just somehow unbiblical to say that, that the Godhead consists of three persons, one God? God the Father is a person. Jesus Christ is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. I'm going to skip around my notes because there's no way I'm going to get to everything. Not only a person, how, how could they have... How could you say they're not persons when they could have different wills? And again, this is spelled out in Scripture. Jesus Christ said in, well, in Luke twenty two forty one, when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested, he was about to be crucified. As a person, a person of the Godhead, he was, he was God in the flesh. The Word made flesh. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Bible says in, in verse 41 of Luke 22, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, Jesus Christ's will was never against the Father's will, ever. They were in tune or in line with each other. And Jesus, being God, could not have a will that is not in line with the Father's will. They all have wills that are in line. However, it's very clear and evident that what he wanted was something different. He still wanted to do everything that God the Father wanted him to do. He had that desire. That was his will. But he wanted to do it another way if it's possible, which would be different than what God the Father wanted him to do originally. That demonstrates a different will. So again, what is the problem with calling it a person? Three persons, one God. I think that very clearly demonstrates that fact about who God is. I don't think it's a hard concept to grasp. When we see a father and a son being related to all throughout Scripture in the New Testament, it definitely gives you a, an understanding that they're different. And then, and then Jesus saying that the Comforter is going to be sent, the Holy Ghost, which is separate from the Father and the Son. Very distinct, not just this subtle distinction. Oh, there's just this little distinction. But it's all just one. Even from Genesis chapter 1, and I heard, you know, I'm bringing up a few points that, he, that Garrett brought up in his little video that he had already, he must have already had prepared. I don't see how he could, I mean, maybe he prepared it. I don't know the facts for that, but he had this thing like being uploaded. And I don't know when everything went down. But from my understanding, it happened very, very recently. And he makes this video and has it uploaded, and it's like, you know, edited a little bit, but whatever, whatever right? I'm not, I'm not going to speculate on when it was created, but it's definitely something he's been thinking about for a long time because he's got a lot of things nailed down. He's, like, giving all this evidence to show why he believes what he believes. This is not something that just happened overnight by any chance. And just, again...
I never thought, I never thought that I would ever say a word against Garrett's character, ever. Because the whole time I knew him, he was an, an, seemed to be an upstanding person and a man of integrity. I don't know how you can be in a position of leadership and, and at such a level of leadership within Faithful Word Baptist Church and having heard in absolutely no unclear or uncertain terms from Pastor Anderson on how the church, the, the doctrine that was going to be administered there, and if you don't believe this, then just get out of the church altogether, how you could, with integrity, stay in a position of authority and leadership within the church and stay in that position and have your doctrine spelled out that was not Trinitarian and not go and tell Pastor Anderson and just say, hey, I don't believe this. He had to be called out on it. How long has he been at that decision point of saying, this is what I believe? It says a lot about a person. But even going back to Genesis 1 1, where God said, Let us make man in our image. And that's where he's saying, Well, he must have been talking to the angels. And it's the same people that these, these crazy Nephilim people that always want to talk about how these hybrid humans and stuff. And I don't know if he believes that. Now, at this point, nothing would surprise me. I mean, he's already calling the sons of God angels, and, and, and the angels were the ones he's talking about, well, let us create man in our image. And I don't, I'm not like this promoter of going back to the Hebrew and Greek to just get some extra knowledge or some things, because this concept of, the God, of, of God being three persons, one God, is found all throughout Scripture. But there is something that's undeniable, and... In, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, the word for God is Elohim. And if you, if you remember from your scripture, from just from reading, even in English, when you read about God's created heavenly beings, you know, seraphim or teraphim, a seraph is singular, seraphim is plural. Baal is singular, Baalim is, pure, is plural. That I am ending makes things plural. When you have Elohim, it literally is. And this, and this is just a well-known, documented fact. This is something that you can look up for yourself, and this is undisputed. It's a plural form of God. It's translated in English as God. Because it's true, because it's God. Because there's one God, but the Elohim is plural. Just demonstrating right off the bat, right from chapter 1, the nature of God. Like I said, that, that's not what you have to rely on in order to see the Trinity in Scripture. It's just one more, one more little piece, one more little evidence, which lines up with everything else. It's not some extra special knowledge that you have to have. It just gels with all the rest of everything else. Just one more piece of evidence. Oh, man, I wanted to get, maybe I'll just probably do this next week or something. I was going to go through and expound all of John 14, but I don't have time for that this evening. So th this last, just, just to demonstrate how much God, and hopefully you haven't been just following along on this stuff. I haven't. I haven't seen all the videos. I don't watch or follow Tyler Baker. Like, I, I, don't, I don't watch what he does, but, <coughs> excuse me. These things come across my personal feeds and I see them from time to time and I see these clips and videos and you know, when, when people are talking about it, sometimes I'll, I'll click on it and watch. And for a while, it's blowing me away. But at this point, it's, to me, it's just evident that God has just darkened their understanding so much that their foolishness is just manifest. And what, this, what, what, I, what I really enjoy about this is that I can look at this and say, Especially if there's any teachers. And again, I'm not referring to someone who might just be some babe in Christ that's tossed to and fro. And not, you know. 
obviously people could get screwed up when they're obeyed, but when you have teachers or people who, you know, for the time ought to be teachers and they've been reading their Bibles and everything and they could just get on board and promote somebody who says some of the dumbest things that I've, that, that I pretty much have ever heard come out of someone who claims to believe the Bible or be a Baptist or whatever. To me, that just demonstrates you have no discernment and you're probably lost too. Here's one of the, one of the other stupid, just totally stupid things that Tyler Baker said. Because the Bible says in John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Again, I mean, how do you not see the difference there? No one's seen God, but the Son, he has declared him. He's talking about and then in, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy 6. is the last place I'll have you turn. Just this total lack of understanding of Scripture at all, just, just not even be able to comprehend what the Bible says because he's unsaved, is demonstrated clearly. When he tries to reconcile John 1.18 with 1 Timothy 6 with this understanding of this oneness. Well, how could, how could no man have seen God at any time? But, I mean, people saw Jesus Christ, right? He literally said that people didn't see Jesus. Yeah. Try to figure that one out. 1 Timothy 6, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, and, and I'll, get, I'll explain this in just a second. It's, I don't think it really needs explaining. I think if, you, if, you have any, if you're saved and you have reading comprehension, you can understand what this verse is talking about. But notice it says, whom no man hath seen nor can see. In verse number 15, you see the King of kings and Lord of lords being mentioned there, right? That's Jesus Christ. So then when he gets to verse 16, he says, well, the Bible says no man has seen him nor can see, so... I don't know how it happens, but I just believe the scripture, so no one must be, have been able to see Jesus Christ. No, fool. Your foolish thoughts are being made manifest to everyone that you're not of God, that you went out from us, but you're not of us. You don't have any comprehension of God's word because you're lost, because you're, you're, you're blind. Let's read this, verse number 16. Is verse 15 talking about Jesus? Yes. Yes who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. Now what's it talking about? God the Father is that light that Jesus dwells in. And in John 14, you'd see if I get a chance to go through this, you know, I am in the Father and the Father in me. He's not saying, you know, he, he dwells in God. He dwells in that light. But what he does here, he just conflates God the Father with Jesus Christ because then he says, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. That is God the Father. No man hath seen nor can see. That's the light that Jesus is dwelling in. The light that no, the God that no man can see or can see. To whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Very simple. And when you, and when you read it, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult at all. But you know who it's difficult for? It's difficult for someone who doesn't have the Spirit of God. It's difficult for the natural man who can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's who it's difficult for. And you know, don't, don't be upset or offended if anyone says, oh, you're, you know, not, not anyone. If, if one of these heretics would say, oh, you're, you're in a cult. You're just blindly following what other people believe, what other people say. Yeah. Anyone who's going to listen to some moron that can't understand such a simple passage as that? Who's the brain dead one? Anyone that's going to promote a person that mocks and ridicules the love that God the Father has 
for the whole world to sacrifice his only begotten son. Anyone who mocks that, I want to have nothing to do with. And if you're friends with that guy, get the hell away from me. I want to have nothing to do with you. I love God the Father way more than that. Blasphemers. And just let it be known whether, whether it's this church or whether the church I'm starting up in Atlanta and for anyone listening to this online, we believe in the Trinity. Yes, the orthodox view of the Trinity. Three persons, one God. That's what we believe. That's what we're always going to believe. That's what the scripture teaches. And that is fundamental to our beliefs. And if you don't believe it, you're not welcome. If you're a brand new believer and you don't understand it, I will be more than happy to take the time to explain it to you. But if you've been hearing sermon after sermon after sermon and you reject it and you're into this oneness garbage and you believe what Tyler, Tyler Terryanism teaches, then you're not welcome. Bottom line, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your clear uh, teachings from Scripture. Lord, I pray for all the churches and pastors out there that are just standing on your words and are not willing to compromise and are not respecters of, of men or of people, and no matter how long they might have been around, dear Lord, but that they're willing to just stand on the truth. God, I pray that you please bless Faithful Word Baptist Church. I pray that you please bless, bless Word of Truth Baptist Church and any other church that teaches the truth, that teaches good doctrine, good, sound doctrine. Lord, I pray that you please help those that have been confused by this, that have been impacted by, by all of this, this just garbage that's been going on. Pray that you please help people to, to have um, a good understanding and that you would just, just help your good doctrine to be, to be spread throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.